Why is everyone obsessed with Fang? Is it the money, the free food, the bragging rights, or is it the promise of success and financial freedom? If you're a techie, the acronym Fang has been so embedded in our way of life that it's become everything that we aspire to be. It's become the ultimate end goal for many software engineers, even if only a handful of people ever make it there. Either way, I wanted to find out why everyone seems to be obsessed with these tech giants. Just what was so damn special about them? To start, we need to rewind back to when the term FANG was first coined. The acronym first came about long ago in 2013, back when some of you were hopefully old enough to know what Zoomies, Hitclips, and MySpace were. Jim Cramer, a finance guru, coined the term FANG. Yes, that's right, it was only four letters back then. Apple hadn't quite become part of the gang yet. These American technology companies represented a rise to exponential market gains by doubling their value in the previous five years. Now, just to give you a picture of what that looks like, here's a look into how Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix were doing back then. Come 2017, we can finally add Apple to the mix as well. Nowadays, however, FANG is more representative of some of the most prestigious tech companies to work for, especially as a software engineer. Their stereotype is having amazing compensation packages, great work-life balance, and great benefits. So what's the catch? Oh, you just have to go through the dreaded semi-broken interview process. Shrunken down to the size of nickels and dropped to the bottom of a blender. What do you do? You take her flat on your right, back right, like right. this. You just lay back, enjoy lay that breeze. Floor, Pretend it's a feather. Grinding data structures and algorithms for the next six months of your life. <laughs> and compete against hundreds of thousands of applicants in order to even get your resume looked at in the first place. How'd it go? Uh, not well. All right then. It's no secret that getting into FANG is really difficult. Most people never even end up getting past the resume screening process, let alone actually landing a job there. So then, why do people still pursue FANG against all odds? Every year, there are thousands of software engineering roles around the world that go unfilled. Yet the competition for getting into these top tech companies has become even fiercer. The first reason may be obvious, but FANG is known for giving huge financial packages to their employees. Their packages are typically broken down into a base salary, sign-on bonus, and annual bonus. Now, one thing most people also forget about are the benefits. The compensation package is really important, but if you're not getting good health care, great maternity or paternity leave, or even the ability to get your education paid for, you may end up spending most of your compensation package on those things anyways. And FANG is notorious for outbidding its competitors when it comes to these benefits, right? Large pools of talent who don't live around the big cities and aren't willing to move there. There are a lot of people in the US um, and in Canada and ultimately around the world who I think we and other companies that go in this direction will be able to access. Well, I decided to do some sleuthing to find out. First, I wanted to compare compensation packages. While browsing through Levels.fyi, I was able to get a more holistic view of some of the biggest tech companies and their offers. Levels FYI, for those of you who don't know, is sort of a real-time way of tracking offers for each company, in each location, for each level. Real employees enter in this information, so it's seen as the closest source of truth when it comes to comparing salaries. Now, if we look at Facebook or Meta, we can see that the average compensation package for an entry-level software engineer is $185,000. That's a whopping sum of money. But let's look a little bit closer. The base salary seems to be $122,000 per year, and the stock is $22,000 per year, while the sign-on bonus is $20,000. The sign-on bonus usually goes away after the first or second year, and the stock usually sticks around for four years on a vesting schedule. So you'll still want to perform well in order to get raises that will eventually make up for the loss of the bonuses. Not only that, but all of these recent salaries are either in California, Seattle, or New York. This greatly skews the data because it's based on cost of living. If a studio apartment costs $1,200 in the Midwest, it may end up costing $3,000 in the Bay Area. Likewise, shopping, food, entertainment are all going to be relatively expensive compared to other parts of the country. Now, don't get me wrong, these are huge salaries. Such a car on the lot. 
Yeah. Is yeah. Jack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make a lot of money? Yeah, I do all right for myself. How much, how much money do you make? I don't know. 70,000 last month. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, no. It's just that the sole number doesn't always tell the whole picture. Now, let's contrast these salaries with someone living in the South. There's not a ton of data here, but it looks like $130,000 is the estimation. This salary is way better than getting $185,000 in one of the more expensive cities. Because these places are over 25 to 40% more expensive, you end up getting a bigger bang for your buck. Similarly, if you're looking for companies in other parts of the country that are still performing well, places such as Accenture, US Bank, Target, American Express, just to name a few, A, the interview process isn't as crazy, and B, the salaries are pretty comparable in their relative areas. When it comes to the benefits, it's a bit harder to find concrete data here. It really does depend on each company and how much they value their employees. I would look at the type of healthcare, including concentration of in-network providers in your area, rates, HSA account options, and deductibles, 401k investment options, number of days off, flex days, spending money for at-home office, maternity leave, and sabbaticals. All of these are important when it comes to calculating your total compensation package. So moving on to the second reason, which is working with amazing technology. Every day, these tech companies seem to be in the news when it comes to using the most groundbreaking technology. First, it was Amazon's cloud services and Meta's metaverse, and then it was Google's immersive view. Using advances in 3D mapping, machine learning, we are fusing billions of aerial and street level images to create a new high fidelity representation of a place. These breakthrough technologies are coming together to power a new experience in maps called Immersive View. It allows you to explore a place like never before. There's no doubt that a lot of these tech companies house some of the most interesting projects and use the coolest technology. So is all of this hype even true? Well, it's definitely true that these companies have to work at a tremendous scale compared to other companies. So in that sense, they are more efficient about solving problems that take into consideration heavy load, lots of traffic, as well as storing and sorting a huge amount of data. This is not always an easy feat, as we do have a limited amount of computing resources to actually deal with all of these transactions. They need to learn to take a creative approach to solving these larger problems. Therefore, it only seems natural that these companies would reinvest into obtaining the best technology as it directly affects their profit margins. Investing in new technology takes time and money, and sometimes these smaller companies can't afford to pay employees to work on R&D for the sake of innovation. However, because these companies are also creating a lot of the new tech, they're also confined to using their own tech to hit the bottom line. For example, it would make more sense for Amazon employees to use AWS versus GCP or Azure, regardless of if the latter was a better option. If Amazon doesn't even use its own product, why would others follow suit? Because of this, people at Google may be confined to using Angular even if React is more approachable, or people at Microsoft may only use C Sharp in the .NET framework rather than exploring Java or Kotlin. So, in a way, it's a cycle of independence that ends up severing the shareability of tech between companies. And at the end of the day, one company can't make the best solutions for everything. So, it needs to adapt and use the best tech that may or may not be created by other companies. While working at Target, a retail company, they acted very much so like a tech company. They did have some in-house products such as their CICD process, but they also had the freedom to be language agnostic between each team. Depending on the problem each team had to tackle, they weren't confined to the language they most recently created or the framework that they had patented, mostly because they never actually created those things in the first place. Another problem with this perception is that a lot of the groundbreaking projects that make it to the news are just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to available work at these companies. 
The sheer reality is that Google will specifically hire PhD candidates that have spent their entire lives researching human-computer interaction when it comes to creating lifelike service robots that interact with people at a checkout lane. They won't be looking to the self-taught or bachelor's degree engineer for that sort of thing. You'd most likely be working on internal tools, changing the interactivity of a website, or adding functionality to an already existing repo that lives deep within the company. Now, don't get me wrong, the engineering process is still really fun, but it's no different than working for a mid-size or unicorn company. In fact, because of less resources being available at these smaller companies, it's actually more likely that you'd get more responsibility quickly at these other companies. So it's really up to you whether or not you wanna be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond. Lastly, perception. We as humans really care what other people think of us. It doesn't matter how much we convince ourselves that we don't care, but at some innate biological level, it does make us feel better when people think highly of us. It gives us a sense of self-worth and value in society. This is much harder to convince people to change. It's a human trait rather than a physical goal. It just takes time and practice to let go of others' opinions and form your own and choose what's best for yourself. I'm not trying to persuade you not to work for Fang, rather to be more holistic when choosing a company. My biggest issue with this acronym is the fact that it's a half-truth. Fang used to represent exponential market growth for American tech companies, but the acronym still hasn't changed since then. Market growth changes all the time, which means we need to adjust our view of what prestige even means. In this case, for example, this year alone, Netflix is at an all-time low. It no longer fits this definition, whereas companies like Square and Microsoft have been doing pretty well for themselves. Not only that, but there are so many fintech and unicorn companies out there that have a much higher rate of return if they end up going public. There are plenty of software engineer turned millionaires that end up getting rich from accepting stock in a private company, only to be bought out or go public later and make a killing. Eventually, Kramer publicly announced his new version of the acronym FANG to MAMA, Meta, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Alphabet. This may stick around for a while until it changes once again. However, you won't see anyone referring to the top tech companies as MAMA. FANG is an acronym that is here to stay, for whatever reason, and although the meaning has been diluted over time, the brand still represents the same level of wealth and prestige that brought people into this industry years ago. At the end of the day, regardless of how true these factors may be, they measure quantifiable results that look good on paper. It's amazing to have a FANG company on your resume or tell people at family dinner parties that you're a software engineer in big tech. But what we don't always measure is that in this wild frenzy towards obtaining a job is how well we fit into the team dynamics, if there's a range of opportunities to learn and take on, are there more responsibilities, is there a good work-life balance? There's no use working at one of these companies just to get burnt out within the next three years. That doesn't end up being sustainable in the long run. Working in the software engineering industry isn't just about coding. It's also a feeling of being needed, much like any other job. If you're a valuable contributor to your team and have a good relationship with your teammates, it just helps boost your motivation and curiosity even more because it's a place you enjoy coming to every day. Just some food for thought. Hopefully when it comes time to make the big decision and jump to a company, you'll make one that's right for you. Bye.